back to our third session of the afternoon with uh, Justin Sun, and the title of his talk is Learn About Linux, Containers, and Networking Through Self-Hosting. Justin. Hi, everyone. Wel welcome. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you are developers? All right. And how many of you have uh, run your own site, website? All right, so it sounds like uh, you're all uh, uh, doing great. You probably don't even need me. <laughs> all right, so a little bit about me. Um, so I'm an engineering manager at Red Hat, a former developer, um, active in the local tech meetups. I'm currently the treasurer of the Boston Java Users ACM chapter, uh, reader and lifelong learner, and longtime Linux user and also a dad. So this all started when my daughter, who's um, a teenager now, uh, came to me and said, I can't take any more photos. And we looked at her uh, camera on her phone. It was working fine. Uh, it turns out that her backup storage was maxed out. And this got me to thinking, well, I'm you know, we have a certain amount of storage. We probably have way more photos than we can actually uh, keep online. And it turns out a little bit of research showed that we needed to go up not one tier, but two tiers of additional storage. Um, so I got interested in self-hosting and started researching some options, especially around photo and video sharing. Um, so an overview of what we'll talk about today. Um, what is self-hosting? Some of my use cases, some options for hosting, uh, some of the network and security aspects to consider, and how to run those applications, um, and some lessons learned. So what is self-hosting, and why should you care? According to Wikipedia, self-hosting is the practice of running and maintaining a private web server. So instead of using a service that's outside of your control. So the key word here is control over your data. Uh, your data is something that you can have access to. It's not being controlled by a third party, which could decide at any point to either stop providing their service, change the terms, make it more expensive, but also privacy. So um, a Pew Research study from 2023 found that 81% of the respondents, these were Americans, were concerned about the use of their private data by companies. So um, probably some of you are part of that uh, percentage. Um, and then cost. So the cost of subscriptions, premium features, and storage they can add up very quickly, especially if you're using um, premium features that you know, are difficult. You know, they, uh, they bundle things together in a certain way so that you have to get a premium tier to get the one feature that you really want. So what were my self-hosting requirements? So what's important for me, so I'm doing this after hours. So I, I want it to be easy to set up, easy to maintain, of course secure because we're talking about privacy, right? We don't want everyone accessing it. Um, and then my added uh, requirement is connecting from mobile devices. So uh, being able to have on my phone access to all the things that are on the server. Um, and then I'm preferring to run open source software. Now, the use case that got me into all this was photo sharing. Uh, photos and videos that you might have in your phone that you want to back up. But then um, you know, I was thinking, well, that's not the only thing you can self-host. I started researching other um, applications. Uh, these include um, password management. So uh, how do we share passwords, let's say, as a family? Um, uh, sharing music. 
And then I, I love to read, so uh, I never have enough time. So I'll find an article and I want to save it to read for later. All right, so um, I'll get to the actual applications I chose. Um, each of these categories can be a, a presentation in itself. And there are many, many opinions on what people like um, for the software to use. All right, let's talk about hosting options. So how would you get started? Well, there are many types of uh, starting points, but the first and probably easiest would be the cloud. So you can start with any of the hyperscalers, AWS, Azure, and GCP, uh, with a free account. Uh, you don't need to have your own equipment. You can simply um, set up a credit card and you'll have a server up in maybe a few minutes. Um, these are free or low cost to get started and there's no hardware involved. So let's talk about hardware now. So um, this is a very popular option right now in the self-hosting community. So having a network attached storage device, um, you can handle large amounts of data to be backed up. Um, you can uh, run even containers and virtual machines through the NAS device. And they're fairly easy to set up. And uh, the one maybe negative is uh, if you want to customize your experience, uh, there are some limits to how much you can customize. Um, there's a cost involved, of course, to buy the equipment, to buy the disks that fit in the NAS device and um, power requirements. So another option is a single board computer. So here you see a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is the five. Um, at the time I was looking at Raspberry Pis, they were constantly in and out of stock. Um, uh, I think now you can probably pick one up from a local store or online. Uh, Vima board is another option. Uh, Vima gives you a little bit of what the NAS has, so running containers, um, some software. It's sort of a self-contained device, uh, fairly inexpensive. And uh, these typically have a large ecosystem. Um, I did look at the Raspberry Pi as a serious uh, contender. Um, however, I found out that it's missing a few things like a power supply, keyboard, mouse, monitor, after I started case, after I started adding up the cost, it became closer to one of the other options. All right, so um, almost in all of the discussions I've seen online or in forums or um, uh, other places have mentioned previous generation desktops. So these are machines made by the likes of Dell, HP, Lenovo. Um, you can probably find something that looks like this online right now for, I don't know, $100 to $200. Um, they're maybe you know, five or six years old, maybe even older, um, but they have a lot of um, a very good price performance trade off. And then uh, finally, we have mini PCs. So these are um, a newer generation of hardware, uh, think of them as a laptop without a screen, uh, keyboard and mouse. And uh, this one in particular that's pictured is, a, is very small. It's about four and a half by four inches and the thickness of three cell phones. Um, it's relatively low power use and not that expensive, I think uh, around $200 US. Um, so what did I pick? for a server setup. So I chose the mini PC. So this is a picture of it. It's a N100 processor uh, with 16 gigs of RAM. And I upgraded the storage to two terabytes. Um, so there's an SSD that was about $120 US. Um, and then installed Fedora 40 workstation. Um, the first time I turned it on, it recognized the hardware, in this case, a keyboard, mouse, and 
27 inch monitor. Um, so you might be wondering why did I choose workstation and not a server? Because um, I'm calling this a home server. Um, it turns out that uh, there are a lot of graphical applications that are very handy to have, um, like software updates um, and some of the other uh, GUIs. So I use Workstation, but you could just as easily install other flavors of Linux or other desktop OSs. Um, so the software to run containers. Um, so after installing the OS, and making sure that the latest updates are in place. I also um, made sure we had Podman. So Podman com comes with Fedora, so that was in a, um, that didn't need to be installed. I did add Podman Compose, which is an extra uh, project that lets you run Docker Compose files. Um, and Podman Desktop, which is a GUI. Um, that's optional, um, but I like to have uh, that uh, dashboard that it shows with um, information about the pods running. All right. Um, so running the applications. So how do you run these in containers? Um, so many of the open source projects um, that you can self-host specifically have instructions on how to run containers. So they'll tell you to download this image from this place. Um, they'll give you instructions if it's a Docker Compose, for example, um, what needs to be set up. And uh, the nice thing about containers is uh, the dependencies are all packaged together. You don't have to think about installing various different pieces of software separately, for example, a database and uh, maybe a web server. Um, these all come with the, um, uh, for example, the compose file. And uh, compose file will have um, aspects of the network, uh, storage, and services um, all bundled together. Um, so let's talk about the applications themselves. So the first one, how I got into this, was photo and video backup. And I chose image, which is um, if you go to image.app, you can find out more info. Um, this is a self-hosted photo and video management solution. Um, it will, the main use case is uh, you install a, an app on your phone, whether it's Android or iOS, and then you would have on the server basically uh, the backup copy of your phone. So that's the main use case that I have in place. So on my phone, I install the app. On my daughter's phone, I install the same app. And then uh, there's software that will go through and back up every single file that you have, depending on the folders that you choose on your phone. You can also um, uh, do facial detection. So, so some of the AI um, uh, type aspects are included in image. So you don't need to give that up even though you're self-hosting. Um, and if the uh, web is still available, I, I can give a quick demo at the end. Um, so next, uh, sharing music. Um, so I chose Navidrome. Uh, Navidrome is a server that pairs with a, a mobile client that you can choose, or you can just use the website. So if you browse to the mobile web, you can also uh, stream the songs from your um, library. Um, so I had uh, my kids look at Navidrome. Uh, apparently, they don't have the same musical taste that I do. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Um, but they got bored after a few, few minutes. Uh, but Navidrome uh, gives you for example, the, le the most recently played songs and um, popular songs that you've rated, um, as well as uh, random. So if you want sort of a jukebox style, um, you can go random. All right, for password management, there is Vault Warden. Um, this is a, an open source version written in Rust of Bitwarden server. And the 
difference between Git Warden and Vault Warden is Vault Warden uses fewer resources. About 30 megabytes, I believe, is what I read. Um, uh, so for a family of four, we don't need enterprise level um, data storage or anything like that. Uh, a simple, um, probably encrypted text file would do. Um, so using uh, Vault Warden as well as the Bitwarden client, which is where all of the uh, crypto, you know, cryptographic algorithms run, um, the clients are the, probably the more important aspect of this. And then for the Read It Later app, I chose Wallabag, which is um, sort of an open source version of one of the you know, popular Read It Later apps. Um, it runs in the browser as an extension, as well as on mobile. And if you're on the phone, you can start reading an article and then continue reading it on desktop or uh, vice versa. Um, so all of this is great. Uh, so the, we have the software, but what about securing access to this? So I mentioned we want to run on mobile devices, uh, but these devices move around, right? So hence, they're called mobile. So when I'm here at BU and I want to check uh, photos at home, how do I do that without going through lots of um, hoops to, to set up security myself? Um, in short, uh, this server needs to be private because remember, privacy is one of the important aspects. Um, so we don't want to, for example, publish the IP address um, have the domain be something well known. Um, we don't want to spend a lot of time doing network setup because I have a day job. I don't want to be a network engineer at night. Um, and we want to avoid any complex configurations. So what's the solution? Yes, someone said it. <laughs> so the solution is a uh, tail scale or a zero trust networking product um, that will um, essentially set up a, v, you know, it's basically a VPN um, based on WireGuard. Each device that you have must run a client. So this would be each mobile device um, or laptop or um, desktop. And the devices form a mesh network. So um, something like TailScale is um, useful for personal use. So this would be one to three users. Uh, of course, if you want commercial use, they would happily sell you an enterprise version of this. Um, um, or if you have a large group, um, perhaps. Um, but TailScale is one of many choices. Uh, it's the one I chose, the first one I tried, and the first one that worked, so I didn't explore further. All right, so we've talked about a um, number of things. Maintenance is the next thing. So now that we're running our own server at home, um, we can't just assume someone else is going to take care of this. We'll have to do some basic maintenance, like security updates of the operating system, as well as the apps themselves. For the operating system, uh, Fedora has this very nice uh, you know, software app, which will inform you when new updates are available. Um, so it's advised that you um, upgrade or update um, as soon as possible. And new versions of the apps, so some of the apps update very frequently. For example, the image, uh, image um, backup, uh, I think had an update yesterday, uh, a couple of days before that, um, over the weekend and last week. Um, and that's just in the last um, less than two weeks. Um, there, there's probably one tonight when I go home. Uh, and the app will inform you, say, well, you, you have this version uh, that you're running and this newer version is available. Um, it is important to back up the data before updating. Um, I will um, be the first to tell you that I fell into this uh, when I first set it up. Um, and speaking of backups, uh, so we're backing up, so the server itself is a backup of all the photos, for example. But then we also have to back up the server because once you start using image, 
um, you'll have, uh, for example, ratings, favorites, uh, albums that you create. And all of this metadata is actually stored in a database. So a Postgres database containing um, uh, all of the important aspects of uh, your photo library. So if you don't back up the database, um, like I did the first time I tried it, uh, you will actually lose it. Um, also, image, because of the way it stores the source images, um, it's effectively random. Uh, they create um, you know, s you know, these random looking file paths and um, image names in the uh, directory structure. So if you actually want to find a file, uh, without the database, you won't be able to find it. Um, finally, um, once you have a backup strategy um, in mind, um, automating that strategy is important. So um, I'm, I will say that I have not gotten there yet, uh, but that's something I'm working on. So some lessons learned. So as I mentioned earlier, know where your files are. So for a backup service, um, one thing I did was uh, I was having trouble setting it up originally. So at one point, I got it to work. And I said, okay, this is great. Let me just back up all my photos. Um, I hadn't checked that the photos that were mounted on the host system were actually there. It looks like there was a temporary location that was set up. So long story short, um, what happened was I uh, found that it was easier to start over and back up my entire library again than to try to undo what's in the database and the file structure once it had been uploaded. So that was about 24 hours of uploading data to a service in the, on a local network, so it wasn't that bad. Um, related to that for Fedora, um, including the colon Z option at the end of the volume um, mount, uh, there's a SE Linux, um, a difference between Docker and Podman is Podman is running as a um, untrusted user, not as root. Um, so it's important to have the colon Z. So I found that I'm now looking at that as the first thing to do um, whenever I see a compose file or a uh, dash V volume mount on the command line. Um, also, try a small sample of files before uploading your entire library to image. Maybe you know, one or two photos. Make sure the files are there and then go from there. So, um, so getting help online. Uh, so if you run into issues, don't panic, even though you might have deleted your entire photo library from the last three years. Uh, it's just a backup of your phone, so you can try again. Um, uh, you can read the FAQs and docs, uh, search online. There, there's a great community online that will um, probably have the answer to your question. Um, so tap into it, and uh, if all else fails, contact your maintainers. Uh, file an issue, a bug report. So I've talked about some applications that I've host, self-host, but what else can you self-host? Um, another major category is um, Home Assistant. So if you have smart devices, uh, light bulbs, uh, smart speakers, doorbells, um, uh, garage door openers, locks, um, something like Home Assistant can help you pull all that together and even integrate competing uh, vendors' um, devices all under one dashboard. Another category is uh, personal media servers. This is probably one of the most popular um, categories. So my particular use case was on photos and videos that I've taken as opposed to, um, let's say, a media library of movies and TV shows. But if you have a library of movies and TV shows. Um, one of these three might be um, helpful for that. So uh, where else can you find more? So here are some resources. Um, I probably spent a long time listening to the self-hosted podcast. It comes out uh, every other Friday. Um, it's, a, um, uh, it's where I learned about Image and some of the other uh, free and open source uh, packages. 
uh, this week in self-hosted. Um, you can find out, uh, it's a newsletter, you can subscribe or you can um, look at their website. Uh, Reddit has a forum for self-hosted. Um, it's extremely popular. Uh, there's the awesome self-hosted um, Git repo. And uh, finally, I have a link to how Tailscale works if you're interested in the nitty gritty um, details. And um, my setup is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the VLink, the mini PC, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, and uh, two terabyte SSD. Uh, and these are the applications that we, we talked about. Right, so uh, questions. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, how long do you think uh, that'll last you before you need to consider upgrading? Uh, that's a great question. So how long will it take me, or how long will it last before I consider an upgrade? Um, so for the device itself, um, I uh, quadrupled the amount of storage. Um, so based on the number of photos I take each year, uh, plus my kids and my wife, um, I would say this can probably last a few years, at least, before upgrading storage. Um, I probably need to go back and clean out some old photos. This is great. Um, could you talk for a minute more? My big concern with doing something like this is the redundancy part. Like, mm. could you talk a little bit more about your backup of your backup? Like, mm. where did you put your backup of your backup and something like that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, where do I put the backup of my backup? So uh, first, I haven't done that yet. So <laughs> 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 but that's, that's next on my list. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, the plan is to back up the SSD onto, let's say, a hard drive and have that done on a regular basis. Yes, so there's a uh, idea of the 3 two, one backup. Right? You have three copies of the data, two different mediums, and one off-site. Did you consider a, a more robust framework like Kubernetes or some one of the like more limited versions of Kubernetes, something super simple? Uh, yeah, so the question was uh, something super simple. Okay, and Kubernetes and super simple don't go together in my <laughs> mind, <laughs> but maybe that's just me. Um, I was reading, you know, on our company Slack, there's a home lab channel, and I was reading some of the posts, and one person was saying, you know, is 32 gigs of RAM enough for uh, this cluster that I'm running at home? And I was thinking I probably won't venture into that just yet. And in terms of self-hosting, you, you could self-host anything. So uh, I think there's a talk coming up on self-hosting an LLM at home. I'm sure they need quite a lot of resources for that. Um, wait, just a question and then an advertisement question. So how does your, um, what network plan do you have or how much like traffic do you drive on your home network? So if I understand the question, it's like, what kind of connection do I have? Yeah. Uh, so it's just a regular broadband connection. Okay, just like a regular one gig up and down. Uh, I, I don't even think it's that much. Oh, wow, okay, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. but, but it's not continuous, right? So I'm yeah. not taking photos every second and then, well, well, I guess if you're a professional photographer, maybe you need more bandwidth. But for, for our use, uh, we didn't need that much. Also, like advertisement, if anyone's in the Boston area, I have like under $20 uh, PCs. So <laughs> if you want some, talk to me. I'll sell a couple to you. Okay, so uh, if, if you want to get started early on your uh, self-hosting, uh, contact that guy.
Thanks, Justin. Um, that yeah, that was a great presentation. And you know, there are a lot of smart people in this room, and I'm definitely not one of them, so I'm going to ask you a very naive question. It seems like there needs to be a certain level of expertise in order to actually go ahead and set something like this in, you know, in my own home, although I'm very interested to get started with something, you know, with setting up a home server. And I'm curious, is there a sort of a learning path that you would recommend following? Like, so maybe a set of things that I would need to know or want to maybe dig into before deep diving into setting something like this, just maybe as like a set of best practices or I, don't, I guess full front, I'm a designer. I don't know anything about code or development, but this sounds pretty interesting to me, and I would love to get into it or start setting it up. And where do I start? Okay, uh, that's a great question. Um, so to get started, I would suggest um, if you're going the cloud route, uh, basically just sign up and start. Right? Uh, you can create a virtual machine in the cloud for free. Uh, you can install, um, you do need to learn a little bit about Linux, let's say command line, uh, Podman. Uh, unfortunately, at this conference, we have lots of Podman talks. And uh, um, I think there's a book signing uh, coming up. The um, other aspect of this might be just installing Linux somewhere. So if you have old hardware, an old laptop you're not using, you could just install Fedora for free and try it out. Um, you might find that it's actually easy, just as easy to use as whatever OS you normally use. Hi, you uh, said at the beginning that you wanted to, you would prefer to run open source software. How, um, how far did you get with that? You know, how much of the, the stuff you're actually running is open source? Are there any notable exceptions? Um, I believe all of the examples I showed are open source. What about tail scale? I'm just curious, like, because I know that you said that that's like limited to maybe only three people. Yeah, so tail scale is open source for the um, client that's okay. running. Uh, the part that's not open is their sort of their control plane. Um, however, there is an open source version of that too, if you really want to host that yourself. Um, okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> No one else has a question. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, quick one. Um, yeah, what kind of open source contributions have people made to uh, have people made to your to the uh, the project? Um, yeah, is there any? Okay, so that's a good question. So for the open source projects that I uh, that I'm using. Um, there was a recent change to image. Um, they actually asked for donations, but they set it in a way that it's basically a license that they will sell you, per perpetual license, um, to support their developers. Um, I, I don't know if that directly answers your question. Uh, okay. What was the biggest challenge you faced in setting all of this up? Yeah, um, I see the biggest challenge was probably that uh, when I first started, I really didn't understand the um, uh, sort of the the data that's being stored, let's say, on the host versus what's in the container, and I still have, you know, a little some questions around that. Um, it doesn't quite line up with what I expected. For example, the UID for the um, file that was created by, let's say, image shows this you know, seven digit, six digit number. It wasn't my name that was there, right? So there's, there's still a few things that aren't, I would say, not quite perfect there. Anyone else? Okay, well, I have a question. How much did all this cost you in dollars? Yeah, so in dollars, uh, it was about 200 for the server, about 120 for the SSD upgrade. And in terms of time, countless hours 
Just to build on top of that, um, one of the things that we talked about yesterday, Justin, was the hardware maybe required for this. So when we talk about costs, like if you're going to set something like this up, what type of work hardware might you even need? And I think one of the things that came up was Raspberry Pi. So something under even $25, $35 might be enough. I mean, there may be an additional cost here and there for storage, et cetera, but you don't necessarily need heavy equipment to get started. Now, is that a fair statement? Yes, that's a fair statement. So in fact, you don't even need any hardware at all, but if you want to use something like a Raspberry Pi for a limited amount of, for example, the music um, uses probably would work just fine on a tiny Raspberry Pi uh, because all you're doing is serving um, you know, MP3s or um, some small files. Um, I can offer some perspective on this. Uh, I think I started doing this HomeLab thing before I had any real income. So I was doing this uh, on zero-ish budget. Um, <laughs> and it's actually quite cheap. Uh, my first computer, I asked around all my neighbors and see, uh, asked if they had something to throw away. And I think my first ever Minecraft server was on a Core 2 Duo or a Pentium 4. And it worked fine. It'll probably still work fine. It'll just be a little slow. Um, there's also really good sources for cheap hardware. Craigslist, eBay. I use government auctions as well. Um, if you keep your eyes out, there's always good deals. But the important part is actually power consumption. The cheaper your hardware, the more you're actually going to pay in power bills. So at some point, it evens out. So I think a mini PC like Justin did is probably the sweet spot in terms of upfront versus um, power cost. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. So the power cost is something like 6 watts at idle, 30 if it's running, let's say, an AI workload um, for the mini PC. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we're uh, we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.